When we examined the Aquatic Graveyards episode and looked at the old red sandstone strata, I wondered if there was a mechanism which would allow rapid deposition into clear layers. I mentioned Guy Berthold, who had performed numerous experiments looking at this phenomenon. So let's explore what the current mechanisms for this process are and what Guy was able to uncover in his experiments. The study of strata is called stratigraphy. It was first coined by Nicholas Steno. He published his work in 1667 and came up with a series of rules that are still used today. Number one, the principle of superposition. Quite simply, this states that each layer above a layer must be younger and any layer below it must be older. Here, each layer is laid down successively in a slow process. Number two, the principle of continuity. This states that the strata owe their existence to sediments in a fluid. At the time when a stratum formed, it was either encircled by another solid body, like a landmass, or else it ran around the entire globe. Number three, the principle of horizontality. At the time when a stratum formed, it would be parallel to the lower surface onto which it was being deposited, and its upper surface would be parallel to the horizon. These principles allow geologists to establish what is called the geological column. By assuming that a. the rate of deposit was the same across the globe, b. that it always occurred horizontally, and c. that the rates of erosion and deposition are the same as they are today. They were able to measure the various depths of sediment layers in this column and estimate their age. One important point to realise is that there is not a single rock formation that shows the entire geological column. They have to piece it together from data from different locations across the globe. Later on, fossil records from various sites was then used to lend credence where similar fossils were found in a similar strata. This gave rise to the fourth principle. Two strata with the same fossil content are the same age. Steno's assertions rely solely on the observations of stratified rock and the fact that the layers appear on top of one another. This process is composed of three phases, erosion, transport, and the deposition of sediment. Here water is the mechanism for transport. The main assumption for the deposition in the case above is that it must occur in still water. There can be no currents which would otherwise disturb this process. When a new stratum is formed, the stratum underneath must be of a solid consistency. When we examine the depths of these strata, we find that one which is between 50 centimetres and 1 metre is considered thick. This means that we should expect to find solid strata after a few metres when drilling a core on the ocean floor. This is not, however, what we find. Instead, we find that the first of these semi-consolidated layers appears after 400 to 800 metres. This directly contradicts what Steno was proposing and indicates that something else must be occurring. There is also no evidence that there are any sedimentary layers that extend all around the planet. Seismic readings and submarine coring demonstrate that the strata in the oceanic deposits are not always horizontal, and the sedimentation rate in oceans is not uniform across the globe. Geologists have attributed changes in the orientation of the stratification and erosion surfaces in sedimentary rock to the fact that the ocean floor has changed its position, moving up or down, and being warped due to the crustal displacement. Guy Berthold was a French sedimentologist who became interested in understanding mechanisms for how this process might work. He constructed and carried out a whole series of experiments to look at how particulates travel in water under a variety of different conditions, which are arguably more equivalent to the way this material would be transported. He found that while conducting these experiments that the aggregate material tended to separate itself according to the particle size, and this would immediately cause the formation of visible layers. Even when no currents were present, the aggregate would separate on settling and cause layers to be formed. When he then experimented with moving currents, he discovered that now the layers would flow with the current, with one being built up on top of the other with a finer layer below and then a larger aggregate layer rolling on top of this. 
he noticed that when the current was changed or pulsed, it would cause the formation of new layers on top of this. These layers would continue to extend one on top of each other, with each layer still exposed at the leading edge. This directly means that animals which die and fall into these exposed layers may die at the same time but end up in different layers, eventually turning into fossils that appear to be in different strata. We have previously speculated that the old red sandstone strata may have formed in a much shorter period than is currently accepted. This process may provide a mechanism whereby this could occur. He also saw that the angle of the layers created was not always horizontal, and many times an angled pattern could be created. This would therefore call into question the assumption that some of the strata we see at angles were once parallel to the horizon. By varying the current flow he was able to create what appears as sediment layers at different angles all formed from the same process and requiring no movement to the floor of the experiment. He was also clearly able to demonstrate that deposits are formed which are parallel to the subsurface layer, not the horizon. His experiments clearly show that stratification of successive sedimentary layers can occur rapidly when a supply of uneven sandy mixture is carried through a current, which is of course exactly what happens when the sediment is carried through rivers out into the sea. Now one question that you might ask is surely we have radiometric dating of the layers that proves the age of them. Now this is probably a topic that is worth exploring in more detail just by itself. But let's just pick two examples here. In order to date the rocks, they sometimes use a process called potassium argon dating. Now Brent Dalrymple, who is a leading specialist in potassium argon dating, has given examples of several volcanoes where the year of eruption is historically known and where the potassium argon dating is completely divergent. This method relies on understanding how certain unstable elements break down into daughter elements. This process therefore assumes a fixed decay rate that remains constant and it also makes an assumption on the abundance of these elements in the initial rock. They compare the abundance of the daughter elements to the parent elements to determine the age. Now another method that you could use is dating of the fossils. And when we examine carbon dating, we also see similar problems. They assume a specific duration for the half-life of carbon-14. They estimate the age of the organism based on when it stopped ingesting carbon-14. Unfortunately, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere has not always been steady throughout history. Cosmic rays are also known to cause irregularities in the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. This therefore requires extensive calibration, which in reality means they are attempting to estimate how this might have changed over time without any actual data. Also, carbon dating is only accurate for samples older than 1200 AD up to a maximum of 62,000 years. And samples can very easily become contaminated. There is also evidence to suggest that unstable atoms can undergo rapid decay when exposed to hydrogen ions, meaning the decay rate cannot be taken as a constant. And this is something that we will explore further when we come back to explore the structured atomic model in more detail. Now one final note that I would like to make is that both Steno and Guy make the assumption that either the transportation or the deposition must occur in water. But what if that was not the case? What if it could be transported through the air, through some electrical discharge event that throws material up into the air? And equally, what if material could become deposited through an electrical charge imbalance in the material itself? Now that could either happen in the atmosphere but equally it could also happen within the water. Now one other question would be what is the impact that easy water has on this deposition process as well? As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.